Dr. Lucy Jones with the U.S. Geological Survey, and I want to tell you about how the shakeout began and the science behind it, because it's what you can use to do your job when the earthquake happens. The shakeout began about seven years ago when a group of scientists got together to create a scenario of what the big San Andreas earthquake would really be like. It ended up, ended up growing into a team of several hundred experts across dozens of disciplines where we tried to make sure we were using the best science, the best knowledge, all the way through to really understand what the earthquake would be like. What we created was terrifying. Terrifying enough that we then created the shakeout drill to try and share the information with people because we understood that the earthquake is absolutely inevitable, but the disaster is not. And the more we understand about what it can do, the more we can change that outcome. So why does it scare me? Well, let's start with what a big earthquake is. A, the magnitude of the earthquake is determined by the length of the fault that creates the earthquake. A magnitude three is on a fault you know, a, a few dozen yards across. A magnitude 6.7 Northridge was a fault that was 10 miles across. To be a 7.8, the fault needs to be about 200 miles long. And the San Andreas Fault in Southern California is longer than that. It's the one really big fault that can give us our biggest earthquakes. And unfortunately, it is our fastest moving faults. So, Big earthquakes happen on each part of the San Andreas at least every 100 to 150 years. The southernmost part of the fault from San Bernardino down to Salton Sea, the last earthquake was over 300 years ago. So the USGS has said this is the most likely really big earthquake in the United States. When it happens, it will begin at an epicenter and rupture up the fault, just like if I were tearing a piece of paper. It doesn't all tear at once. You, you rip down the piece of paper, we rip down the fault. That means that it has to travel down a 200 miles of fault, and it's gonna take 100 seconds to do that. By contrast, Northridge was seven seconds long. So the first thing that's really different in a really big earthquake is how much longer it lasts. The earth produces energy for 100 seconds, and then that travels through the earth and vibrates and bounces off of things. Really strong shaking is likely in downtown Los Angeles for 50 seconds. By comparison, Northridge lasted seven seconds. What happens in all of that? So first, we're affecting all of Southern California. In the big San Andreas earthquake, the southern part of Los Angeles County, the, you know, the urban, big urban areas, are going to be farther away from the earthquake and won't be as badly affected. Uh, the northern part of the county, the fault runs through Palmdale. And here in the basin, unfortunately, when we get to those really big earthquakes and all of that energy, it gets trapped in the basin and it shakes sort of like a bowl of jello, which is why we're saying 50 seconds of strong shaking in the basin. What are the consequences of that? We estimate 300,000 buildings will be badly damaged enough to lose at least 10% the value of the building. 1,500 will be complete collapse. We know mostly which those buildings are, and you could find them out within your coverage area. They are the, the oldest URMs, the unreinforced masonry brick buildings, if they haven't been reinforced, we're looking at collapse. Even if they have been reinforced, the walls are going to come down. We just hope we keep up the roofs. You know, find the brick buildings. Those are the ones that are going to be really bad. Uh, concrete buildings. The older type of concrete built before 1980. That's the type of building that was the Olive View Hospital that collapsed in 1971. We have about 1,500 of those in the city of Los Angeles, thousands of them across Southern California. They are the deadliest buildings because when concrete collapses, it, it's, it's so heavy, it kills a lot of people and traps them. So those are the worst buildings. They're not all bad. It depends on how they're built. You need a structural engineer's evaluation to be sure, but that's our second class. And most of our casualties are gonna be 
coming out of our concrete buildings. Uh, the, the other type is the Northridge Meadows type apartment buildings or anything else where the first floor has big openings, we call it a soft first story. So we know where these buildings are, about 300,000. We are going to end up with a situation that one out of every 60 people in Southern California will have lost their house. 250,000 people that are going to need a place to live. We also know that we're going to lose a lot of bridges. Now, it's actually a lot less likely right now that we're bringing down a lot of interstates because after what happened in 89 and then 94, Caltrans has spent many, many billions of dollars retrofitting their bridges and they're a lot less likely to fail. Unfortunately, we haven't had a similar program for city and county bridges. So there are a lot of places, if you've got a an overpass, uh, if you've got a, a, a river that you're passing over, know that those are potential failures and you want to know you have your ways around those type of, of places. The other problem, we have 300,000 buildings, we're bringing a lot of debris into the roads. A lot of the roads are going to be clogged and you're not going to be able to pass through. So transportation is going to get extremely difficult. We also expect to lose the electricity right away. The, the model that we went through with the big San Andreas one, because we have huge transmission lines that cross the San Andreas Fault and have not yet been engineered to handle the fault moving 30 feet during the earthquake, we expect the transmission lines from the Colorado River to LA to go down. The grid is then going to shut itself down to protect itself. And Southern California Edison's model is that all of Western North America will be dark with about 80 seconds after the beginning of the earthquake. It's going to take a, a lot of time to bring it back. So, no electricity, also then, of course, no s traffic lights. And moving around, it's going to compound the transportation problems there for the first few days. As we look at all of this, it sounds pretty bad. I'm just now getting to the bad part, and that's the triggered fires. When we look around the world at what happens in the biggest earthquakes, the number of fires that get started is really proportional to the number of houses that restrain, receive strong shaking. We had 111 fires in Northridge, 110 in San Fernando, both relic those small faults. Take it out to that really big fault that we, uh, we have for this magnitude 7.8, we estimate 1,600 fires will be started large enough to call the fire department. Um, there are not that many fire engines in Southern California. And so one of the big issues is how do we get fires stopped as quickly as possible? How much should we be training individuals to fight a fire after the earthquake that normally they'd call the fire department? Are you going to be able to get to them? How quickly can we get them out? Uh, we also expect to be starting wildland fires. Uh, where we have up in Cajon Pass, we have two petroleum product pipelines that cross a natural gas pipeline at the San Andreas, and our pipeline expert said crater. There will be a very large fire started, it's right by I-15 up in Cajon Pass. Presumably it won't be fought until we've dealt with the places where people are more directly at risk. So we're going to have a real uh, difficult decisions to make at that point as a lot of things are burning. Um, there's a world expert on fire following earthquake who did this study for us and his estimate was that the fire losses would double the losses in the earthquake. Uh, the equivalent square footage of 130,000 single family homes to go up in conflagrations. Uh, and that was the model made when we specified there'd be no Santa Ana winds. I wish I could do that for the real earthquake, I obviously can't. And so there's going to be, the, the fire following earthquake is the one that has the potential for really um, taking this from disaster to catastrophe. It was the experience in San Francisco in 1906, it was the experience in Tokyo in 1923, and uh, how much we can mobilize to get those fires under control is going to be critically important. Of course, then we've also got to deal with the potential for lack of water. And right now, our water system is the most vulnerable. That's part of what contributed to the large losses in our, in our modeling. And the degree to which we can improve our water infrastructure is going to really change the picture for you. But plans for how to fight uh, fire with sources other than hydrants 
really needs to be part of the planning as well. So this is what that first two minutes, three minutes of shaking looks like. These fires getting started, this level of damage. We then need to think about the aftermath, the response into recovery. One thing is aftershocks. Northridge could very well occur as an aftershock to this earthquake. On average, the largest aftershock is 1.1 units magnitude smaller than the main shock. 7.8 mag uh, main shock magnitude, 6.7 is the likely largest aftershock. Could be larger, could be smaller. Most of them will be very near the San Andreas, which is luckily outside of uh, the Los Angeles County urban area. As I said, Palmdale, the fault runs through. San Bernardino, Coachella Valley are the other areas that are right on the fault. But we often see triggered earthquakes off of the fault. On the day of the 1906 earthquake, there was a magnitude five, five and a half in Santa Monica Bay. There was a magnitude six in Imperial County. There were magnitude fives in Oregon and Nevada. And we are pretty sure that those are essentially distant aftershocks to the 1906 earthquake. So we should expect to be seeing more earthquakes that day, potentially all over the state of California. Many of them likely to come in and be in the urban area and cause further damage. So as we're looking at um, the urban search and rescue activities, you've got to be doing it knowing that you could be continuing to have really strong shaking. One of the things we're trying to do as seismologists to help you with this is developing the earthquake early warning system so that you can at least have a few seconds warning knowing that the um, shaking is coming from an aftershock uh, and we're, we're working now on how to be able to get that information reliable and into hands of people like the fire department that can use it. The aftershocks do die off with time. Many people think that if they decrease in number and magnitude with time, and that part is not true. The relative distribution of large to small stays the same as the number dies down, and we have this very long tail where we continue to have felt earthquakes most days, and you know, for every hundred threes, we have 10 fours and one five, and for every 10,000 threes, because that's gonna be more the picture with this sort of earthquake, we need to still be having magnitude fives and sixes, and they will be continuing for months and even into years. Three years after our last Southern California San Andreas earthquake, we had a magnitude six and a half aftershock. So it's going to be part of our lives for years after this event. Uh, and everything we do in the response is going to help us with the recovery. And the big concern we have when we look at the the big picture is what are we doing to the economy of Southern California? How do we get people back into their homes, businesses back up and open so people can afford to stay here? Um, I love Southern California and I want it to be here and be a place that my children and grandchildren can grow up in and for that to happen we need to make sure that when the earthquake happens we don't take out our economy and that means fighting the fires effectively getting our infrastructure back up and running and making it possible for people to stay here and go back to work. We've got a, quite a differential here. Here, where you're standing, the whole, uh, whole second floor collapsed on the first floor. Yet, Right next door to us, it held. So here we had three. We ended up with three full stories, and it didn't collapse. But uh, further over there, it, it had tilted wildly and was uh, imminent. We had imminent collapse, and the whole building was rocking every time we had an aftershock.